Welcome to everyone to our 26th event. And this is a special event because this is celebrating the International Women's Day, which was uh, on 8th of March. And to celebrate that, we have a special event to um, to welcome and celebrate all the women in tech and the allies in our community. Um, like I was mentioning, we have this event is a special one and we have two female speakers and two allies as well. And they will all be telling us about, talking to us about their journeys and also then we will move on to, to, the, to the sessions and to the main talks. So before we start with the main session, a little bit introduction about why Wi-Fi Berlin. Well, we all love Berlin and we're all based Berlin or somewhere in Europe and we love sharing ideas. And when the Python visited Berlin, it, timed, it, it climbed the TV tower and said that, hey, I'm here in Berlin. So we formed the Pi Berlin community. We welcome everyone who is interested and we are very happy to share with you that our community has grown from a small group of five to 10 people to now over 2,500 people. And we're very excited to have all of you on this journey with us. Our organizers are Anastasia, myself, Shreya, Theo and Lyuben. Lyuben just joined this, uh, this month and we're very excited to have you Lyuben on board as organizers. Anastasia is managing the Zoom link and the slides and um, she's been with the organization with Pi Berlin the longest. So thank you Anastasia for managing this and being the driving force behind Pi Berlin. Theo will be helping us with the questionnaire and with the closing slides and you will be seeing him more in the later part of the session. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. This is our 12th online event. We started, I think, in April or even before that last year when uh, Corona happened. And since then, we're very proud that we have done uh, an event every month and we have had people joining in from all over, all over, all over Europe and all over the world because it's online right now as speakers, as, as attendees, which would not be possible if, if, the, or if the events were offline. So some perks of having online event as well. Also, we were talking on Twitter today with um, Pi Amsterdam and Pi Ireland, and let's see if we can have a combined event because it's online in future. We do not have many rules and regulations, but one thing that is very important for us and for our community is that we be nice to each other, be a little patient. Sometimes things can go haywire, just like our speakers were so considerate today to organize and bear with us when we were hustling through managing everyone's time. So <clears throat> just requesting everyone to be nice and the state is yours. I hope you can see my screen. <clears throat> Yes, so, so um, also it's a very safe platform. You can ask questions. There is no feigning surprises, no well actuallys or no just isms. Any question, big or small, please, please feel free to ask. Also, um, you can ask your questions at the end of the slides or just post your questions in chat on, on, the, on Zoom. And um, yeah, we're a very welcoming community. Just be nice and kind and be, as we said, be a little patient and uh, please feel free to post your questions. Today's event was sponsored by Scout B and Anastasia made this possible. So thank you to Scout B and Anastasia for helping us with Zoom and uh, making this event possible. So today's agenda, after going up and down with it, we have finalized today's agenda. And the first speaker is Jigyasa Grover who will be talking about data set curation. The second speaker would be a lightning talk Yuren Gimak, and he will be talking about testing the talks for pre-release at scale. The third speaker is Pradma Srinivasan. She will also be giving a lightning talk and will be talking about what if Corona never happened. Along with this, we're also looking for organizers. So if you would like to join and understand what is happening behind the scenes, or if you would like to make these online events possible, then please reach out to us and we would love to have you on board. Also, we are looking for speakers. And when I say speakers, do we mean just professional speakers? Well, I don't think so. When I say speakers, we're looking for people that have something to share, a personal project or something that interests you, or if you want to practice your presentation skills before maybe speaking at a bigger conference, then please feel free to use our platform and reach out to us. 
The format of the talks are two. You can give a lightning talk of five to 10 minutes or a proper 30 minute talk. Also, if you don't want to have Q&A, it is, it is totally up to you and we can manage that. So if you're interested, then please submit your talk proposal here on the, uh, on, on, you can see the QR code on the screen. Also, you can reach out to us on our meetup page or on Twitter and we can make something possible as per mutual convenience. Our next event is in April. We have not yet finalized the date. We are still working on that, but um, feel free to reach out to us and we will keep you posted by posting it uh, on Twitter and updating on our meetup page as well. And also we are on Twitter with the handle Piberlane Python. We would love to hear from you what you have to say about it, whether you like the event or if you have some feedback for us, please feel free to tweet on Twitter about it and tag us when you do that with the handle Piberlane Python. We are also on the Slack community with, um, with the link mentioned on your screen, pythonberlinslack.herokuapp.com. And before we start the event, we would like to say a huge thank you to some people and some resources uh, which made these slides and these events possible. The presentation was created by Slides Carnival and the photographs by Unsplash. Also some people who helped create with logo and story was Elena, Constantin and Christian. So thank you so much for this. And um, with that, we welcome our first speaker, but I think there is some issue with the slides. Yes. Uh, we will welcome our first speaker, who is Jigyasa Grover, and she will be talking about data set curation. About Jigyasa, she is a machine learning engineer at Twitter, and she's joining us from San Francisco. So thank you so much for joining Jigyasa. She's also a co-author of the book, Sculpting Data for ML, a Red Hats Women in Open Source Academic Award winner, and Google Summer of Code alumna. So with that, Jigyasa, over to you. The stage is yours. Please welcome and thank you for making it possible. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll just quickly uh, share my screen before I begin. Cool. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Jigyasa Grover. And um, as thank you, Shreya, for such like a wonderful introduction. Um, Today we'll be talking about how we can sculpt the right kind of data for our machine learning models. Um, I hope everyone can see my slides. Just one yeah, quick. Yeah, we can. Yes. Cool. Thanks. So the last couple of years have seen an immense growth uh, of machine learning in multiple domains, from influencing our shopping list to cars, uh, self-driving around themselves in the town. Um, unquestionably, machine learning is the most used and abused subdomain of artificial intelligence presently. Um, it is being wielded in um, improving healthcare, advancing warfare, scrutinizing your resume to determine your creditworthiness, and even creating music and meaningful lyrics. Uh, it can synthesize pictures or videos of people who don't even exist and so on. So regardless for our fascination or our loathe for it, it is definitely influencing our decision-making power and it is dominating our lives heavily. Uh, what is machine learning? Uh, basically to describe, uh, it would be enabling computers to learn on their own is what encompasses machine learning. Uh, the power of spotting patterns on their own without the requirement of programming uh, is the biggest edge these decision-making systems have over the others. Uh, researchers keep traversing the unexplored territories of machine learning, whereas according to experts, uh, the businesses have just seen the tip of the algorithmic iceberg. Uh, going into the numbers, according to Finance Online, $28.5 US billion were allocated to machine learning worldwide in just the first quarter of 2019. And it is expected to grow up to 40 billion US dollars by 2025, where we meagerly started from 1.3 billion US dollars in 2016. So that has been a huge growth financially. Uh, in terms of numbers of the companies, almost 50% of startups, uh, which have increased at a 14 X rate, have either been exploring or planning to do machine learning in the near future. And they're solely, uh, and the 14 X times in the increase of uh, startups is basically those which are focused purely on machine learning. 97% of mobile users uh, use machine learning trained voice assistants with a 40% of search just powered by voice. As you can see, uh, there are dominant leaps 
uh, in machine learning, which are leaving the scientists, investors, policy makers, business leaders, and audience bedazzled, uh, hinting that the human-like intelligence in machine might just be around the corner. Um, nonetheless, uh, progress in machine learning has been impressive, but there's a lot of pending explanation and examination, which keeps research going on. Uh, it is magic? Definitely not, because uh, we all know who created and how we can manipulate machine learning. Hence, it, for the state-of-the-art learning algorithms to work their magic, it's important to focus on the three key dimensions, well-calibrated data, sophisticated algorithms, and efficient computation. So these three key dimensions would definitely help the learning algorithm to nurture better. The strong build of algorithms, which we talked about the sophistication, they come from the iterative process of validating hypotheses through experimentation. Whereas the efficient computation that we were talking about usually comes from the learning algorithm using distributed computing to run at large scale. However, the third key dimension, which is laying the foundation of the process with the perfect quality and the perfect quantity of data, uh, is the secret sauce for creating a successful machine learning model. Hence, we can say data is the new oil. And since we've progressed a lot from a rule-based approach which you used to you previously uh, to a more data-driven approach, it goes without saying that machine learning algorithms are trained to capture implicit information from the data that you have provided. Hence, it is very true that the approaches nowadays, the contemporary approaches are very, very data hungry. Without going into like a lot of mathematical details, uh, you must have, uh, like for those who are like uh, pro at machine learning or just don't have an idea, they must be knowing that deep learning algorithms have many parameters that need to be tuned uh, in the neural network. And therefore they need a lot of data in order to come up with a somewhat generalizable model. So in that sense, having a lot of data is the key to coming up with good training sets for those kind of approaches. Uh, the type of data that you feed into the algorithm does ends up having a profound effect on the success of the algorithm. Uh, worthy data collection forms the foundation of the pyramid. Uh, and the pyramid that I'm talking about is the AI hierarchy of needs, which is drawn parallel to the Maslow's hierarchy of human needs by Monica Rogatti, who is a renowned data scientist and AI advisor. To give a quick glimpse, this is how the uh, pyramid looks like. And Monica Rogatti, she puts forward that data literacy, data collection, and data flow forms the basic need, which must be satisfied in order to achieve the tip of the pyramid, in order to achieve self-actualization, in order to achieve nirvana, which in our case would be the ultimate attainment of AI. So as we talked about that the type of data fed into the algorithm has a profound effect on the success of, uh, uh, has a profound effect on it. So it's very necessary that we feed the right kind of format uh, of data. And machine learning models basically uh, end up being as good or as bad as the data that you have. And Peter Norwig has put it in a very clever way, saying that more data beats clever algorithm, but better data beats more data. So uh, coming to data, now that we have established that data definitely has like a lot of importance in machine learning, we should talk about how and where it affects. So usually machine learning, uh, we can talk about academia first. So in academia, core machine learning and data science research groups, uh, they are oriented more towards novelty and advancing the fields, many a times weighing it much higher than money-making logic or performance scaling. So in this attempt to work on new problems, um, finding collaborators from pertinent domains and seeking funding for research projects are not the only obstacles they face. They also have to look for relevant data sources in the absence of in-house data, contrary to corporate giants who usually have access. Uh, whereas established organizations are in the industry, they seldom have obstacles in obtaining computation power or hiring folks with expertise in corresponding domains or accessing relevant data. The challenge, however, comes up in scaling up their solutions to massive user base. Uh, any organization would have like a lot of unstructured data available on its hand as raw logs. However, developing an efficient data processing pipeline still remains a task. So uh, depending on why we want to collect data, there are different approaches to building a good quality data set. Uh, but before we talk about it, uh, let me introduce to three data sets also available on Kaggle, uh, built by my co-author just as we begin, began writing the book. 
so the first would be the clothing fit data set to improve customers online shopping experience and to reduce product return rates um, it is vital to have a nifty clothing size recommendation framework in place uh, we use modcloth which is an online retailer of indie and vintage inspired uh, women's clothing to create data sets for this use case uh, this data set basically contains fit feedback from customers on their purchased clothing items and in the other information like ratings reviews category information um, customer measurements and so on this data set uh, helps identify critical features that determine the fit of a particular clothing product for a particular customer so this was the clothing fit data set um, the next data set was a sarcasm detection uh, sarcasm data set basically past studies for sarcasm detection tasks have mostly used data from twitter which is a micro blogging and a social networking service the data from it uh, is usually collected using hashtag based supervision uh, you, however such data sets are noisy especially in terms of label assignments and the language used to overcome these limitations uh, we've used the onion and half post to create a custom data set for our purpose the onion is kind of like an american satirical uh, digital media company that publishes uh, sarcastic articles on international national and local news uh, whereas half post uh, reports the corresponding real news uh, and the third data set that we'll be talking about would be the news category data set uh, so this data set basically has about 200,000 news headlines from 2012 to 2018 uh, having uh, details like news category headlines short description of news stories publication date and so on so now that we know uh, the three data sets that we'd be referring to and circling back to depending on why we want to collect data there are different ways uh, ways to approach uh, building good quality data sets considering uh, the situation where we have like a specific problem in mind we want to discuss um, and address with the help of data we kind of have like a north star and in that case we follow the guided search approach if you're just curious and want some interesting data points unguided search should be enough to fuel that wanderlust so both these situations have their challenges and in the following uh, slides we can talk about how we can learn to overcome them so the first uh, approach that we talk about is the guided search. Uh, when we have like a specific problem in mind, we have to build a data set to address that machine learning problem. And in that case, we go with the guided search approach. Um, in, look, in a lay person's uh, term, we can say, um, the first would be formal problem definition in which you formally define a problem, like what your input would be, what your output would be, what are you kind of like expecting? And the second comes out to be essential data signal determination. Uh, a data signal can be thought of as a piece of information transmitted by a particular data point. In the size recommendation problem, we want to have uh, like a clothing size for customers. And we can identify as essential data signals for a particular purchase. Uh, they would be user ID, product ID, size purchase, and fit feedback. If you think of it, these four data signals are the only ones that are very essential. The ID features, why are they required other than the size purchase and fit feedback are to basically tie the required information from the product to the customer and hence making the data point unique. Undoubtedly, we can collect other data signals uh, for a transaction like product category or user age. However, they are of not absolute necessity. Uh, the skill of identifying these essential data signals, uh, they come from problem understanding, they come from domain knowledge, and they come from experience. Uh, but the following ways could definitely assist you. Um, so uh, searching the web for a legitimate source with all the required uh, signals is where you can find the data set. And this is where our Googling skills would come in handy. So for example, uh, for this uh, clothing fit data set, we initially considered Zappos, it's an online shoe and clothing retailer. Uh, it seemed promising at first because it did provide user ID, the product ID and fit review and many other data signals that we talked about. However, the size purchase signal, uh, which was predetermined as an essential data signal kind of threw like a red flag. And on the other hand, we got uh, all these essential data signals from mod cloud, which led us to the above the identified um, data set and curated. And same way you can think of like, uh, say combining multiple signals from different sources. So let's assume um, 
the sarcasm detection data set. Uh, it is a perfect example of combining data from multiple sources. So as we talked about previously, um, we took the sarcastic headlines from the Onion and the non-sarcastic ones uh, from HuffPost, and that's why we were able to combine them together. So this is something that is important to keep in mind, how you can combine signals from multiple sources when you don't have them all in one. Um, another consideration while selecting a data source could be how, like, how much data is enough data. So basically having a sufficiently large data set. Non-supportive instances could be when online retainer does not have enough customer reviews uh, reporting a feedback or the new source does not have like an old archive, old uh, posts. Um, at this point, uh, there definitely comes a question of like data volume requirement. Uh, it definitely depends on the kind of problem. So let's say you have like a machine learning classification problem. In that way, we could see that the ratio of number of data points to the number of classes should be large enough. For example, 20,000 data points might be enough for like two categories of uh, two classes that you have, but not enough for like 10,000 classes. Um, this step is very open-ended and be considered based on like one's personal preference. Uh, but once you've shortlisted data source that provides all the essential data signals and has like sufficient volume, there could be different ways to Im further improve the data set. Uh, an idea would be to combine multiple sources for more signals, or um, always think about like how you can engineer better feature, uh, features, um, basically when you uh, think about data and solve like a broad problem. The second uh, would be uh, the unguided search. So in previous, we did have like a problem in mind, but here we do not have a problem in mind. We're just like creative souls are planning to fashion an exciting distinctive yet worthwhile data set. Uh, in this, we can refer to news category data set, because if you think we did not create that data set with like a specific problem in mind, instead we just curated the data. And in that you could use it for multiple purposes, uh, be it like identify find the categories of a news headline, which is like the most basic. You could also um, train the classifier news category data set, which could help identify any process writing style, whether it has like a political uh, tone or a humorous tone, it's a criminal report, or it's based on the latest fashion trends, et cetera. So you can have like a percentage speaking going on. It can also help tag um, untracked news articles or understand how different writing styles are for like different news types. Um, the biggest uh, challenge for unguided search of data sets would be that it involves uh, uncertainty to a vast extent. Since we're not sure like what kind of data signals we require in a data set, uh, clearly because we do not have like a specific problem in mind, there's no proper structure for consequent uh, search operation. Although uh, not knowing the problem definitely makes things much more difficult. Um, the dimensions of like um, contemporary practical problems you have to think about, or it could be just the ability of leading to fascinating insights into some phenomena. Uh, one thing to be noted is uh, like, uh, so according to a uh, resource publication, uh, Patterns for Learning with Side Information, it says generalization of the learned function to unseen data can be improved by incorporating side information. So side information are data that neither is from the input space, not from the output space. It is more about metadata. So uh, it is necessary that if you can incorporate metadata into um, your uh, data set, for example, uh, predicting a product's price from just the essential data signals might not go very well if you do not have the metadata around it. So metadata could be, say, the brand or the fabric of the product and so on. So these kind of things also help you, you know, predict a product's price and so on. Uh, I've talked a lot uh, in theory, uh, theory about how to create a data set. And the bottom line would definitely uh, be when you have a workflow like this, uh, like especially like a machine learning workflow and people like, you know, try to just get started with machine learning. They usually focus on this part, which is uh, defining appropriate metrics and choosing the right kind of model. However, it is also necessary to focus on uh, sourcing the data or fabricating the data. Uh, on our own. So processing the data set and performing feature engineering is equally important, or I would rather say much more important than choosing the model, because uh, as we saw that our models perform as good or as bad as our data set is. Uh, so in that sense, we also uh, launched a recent book, which is Sculpting Data for ML, the first act of machine learning. Uh, the link is right here in case uh, you want to check it out. 
but it mostly talks about the significance of data and machine learning, which you've already uh, covered quickly, and the end-to-end -end process of data collection. I believe today would have been like too much of information given 30 minutes to talk about the technical aspects or like uh, how to use beautiful soup and selenium to basically automate, uh, automate that process of uh, collecting data signals and feature engineering and step by so basically if you're interested in like a step-by-step -step guide of uh, how to curate data sets before you actually do machine learning in python definitely check this book out um, it is endorsed by leading ml experts uh, you can read forwards by julian mccauley who's an associate professor at uc san diego Lawrence Morney, who's like a renowned uh, artificial intelligence lead advocate at Google, and then Menking Wong, who's also like a senior applied scientist at Microsoft. So all these people that we've worked a with um, who shaped our experiences, especially in data set curation, is what's something that we put forward in this book. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you so much. Um, I hope you enjoyed, and I'm open to questions if you have any like, specific to machine learning or how to create data set and identify signals. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the very interesting uh, talk to Yasa. Uh, does anyone have questions? Please uh, uh, feel free to unmute yourself on Zoom if you have any direct questions. You can also write the questions in the chat if you want, in the Twitch chat or the Zoom chat. Perfect timing with the neighbors uh, for the walls. Um, hi, so I have a question. First, thanks for the interesting talk, um, Jigyasa. And um, so you mentioned in your presentation that uh, more data is better, or basically there are two approaches. You can use more data uh, with the same algorithms and hope that this will improve the risk performance, I guess. Uh, but also you may use, um, you, you may try to find some um, some interaction in, in the data, so you have less data, and then you have better performance. So, which approach would you maybe suggest uh, experience? Sure. Uh, so, talking about uh, like referring back to my slides, uh, I did say like more data would beat uh, clever algorithms. But then clever data would be like clever algorithms, much uh, like more data, basically. So uh, like the gist of saying that would be, uh, it is not necessary that you should have like a lots of data to uh, basically beat your uh, like for a clever algorithm. The reason being um, there, there could be certain features when you do feature engineering, which uh, bloat up the feature space. So you definitely need to cut down on that space because you might need the other parameters to take up that space. So it's not necessary for you to have like tons of features. It could be, you could like cleverly create such features that even in like five or 10 features, they perform like equally, your model performs equally well. And the second would be, uh, of course, there's the thing of space and it would be uh, training time and interpretability and explainability of the model. So definitely it is suggested you that you have like as minimal of features as you require, like which are very essential to build that data set. Uh, I hope that answers your question as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think it's a uh, open-ended question, so I That's don't think true. yeah. But thanks for the insights. Yeah. 
Okay, then I see there are also no questions in the chat. So if there are no further questions, I will let uh, Shreya introduce our next speaker. Hello, and um, thank you, Jigyasa. That was very interesting. And Jigyasa is also the author of a book called Sculpting ML. And she's just posted the link in the chat as well. So if you're interested, please uh, read the book. And I'm sure Jigyasa would look forward to what you have to say about it. Jigyasa thank is also you. active. You're welcome. And she's also active on Twitter. So please feel free to reach out to her. Uh, our next session or our next talk is a lightning talk. And Jurin, would you be going next? Sure. So Great. let's start. So our next speaker is Jurin and over to you. Uh, thank you. So my name is Jurgen Kmach. Uh, I'm a software developer. I mostly do Python web development. I also do Linux uh, sysadmin and I love open source. That's me. You can always reach out to me on Twitter at uh, jugmark 0 or via email. So today I want to tell you something about my latest open source journey. And this time it's about Tox. Um, Tox, if you don't know it, is a virtual env management and test command line tool. So what does this mean? Here I have a little side project of mine. That's a command line interface to the Have Been Pwned API. And I use Tox for testing. And with tox-l, I can list all environments which I test. So I test my application for uh, Python 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9. I also do coverage. Uh, I do linting with pre-commit. And I also do static type analysis with MyPy. I can execute uh, the test suite for Python 3.8 by just uh, specifying it. And it takes a, a second, and then the test will run and I pass and it's all good. What's even better, uh, Tox gets currently rewritten completely from scratch. And this is done by Bernard Gabor, the, one of the maintainers of Tox. And um, like two weeks ago, he reached out on Twitter and said, hey, uh, I'm currently writing it and I released a, a pre-release. Please, uh, if you use Tox3, test it. And uh, that's a super good idea, both for us, the users, as we can make sure when uh, Tox4 gets finally released, our application will still work with it. And also for Bernard, because he doesn't get all the bug reports uh, maybe uh, in the day of the release. So how do you install a Python package, a pre-release? Uh, some time ago, I collected a couple of ways to do this. I usually go with pip install dash dash pre and then the package name. Over here, I did this already. And now I have the tox4 binary available on the my path with dash l. I get the same uh, environment list. And then I, I also can uh, run the test suite. As you can see, uh, the output is a little bit more verbose. And we have funky new colors, which I really like a lot. And well, it works now. This was not all the time because I'm a really early adopter of, uh, of the Tox4 rewrite. And I already reported a couple of issues and at the, the Tox issue tracker and Bernard fixed them in no time. So I, I tested uh, Tox4 for my 10 like personal projects for my 10 work projects or so. So I'm done now, right? No, because I'm also a co-maintainer of the SOAP project. SOAP is the, the grandmother or grandfather of all Python web frameworks. It's like uh, 25 years old, still alive and kicking. And there is one outstanding feature for SOAP and that it's all its plugins or mostly of the plugins are in the same uh, <clears throat> uh, GitHub organization. And there's one big plus on uh, for this. When there's something broken like CI, when uh, you want to have support for Python 3.10 or some uh, dependency has changed or whatever, you can just go to the repository, apply the changes, and you get a new package or new build. 
Compare this to other frameworks where mostly the plugins are written by individuals. Um, maybe at one point in time, they change uh, the framework, the language or the company, and they lose interest in supporting uh, the plugin and you have to fork it or whatever, but you can't fork all of them. So we don't have actually 392 active packages, but it's more like uh, 300. <clears throat> the rest is archived. So, but still 300 repositories have to be maintained. How do you do this? And I um, found a really good tool. It's called Our Repos, written by Anthony Sotile. And as you can see here, there are a couple of commands you can use. And like here, all repos clone. You can clone all your uh, repositories at once, all 300, because you don't want to do this by hand. Um, you can also search and uh, search or find files, and you can grab in them. You can uh, list all your repositories. And what is uh, super cool, you can also manipulate uh, all repositories at once with all repos set. That's the stream editor. And a couple of months ago, when Travis CI announced the migration from travisci.org to travisci.com, I used all repos set to uh, change our batch URLs, you know, that uh, green little signs uh, for all our repositories with one single line and one finger stroke. And then uh, one PR after another was created automatically, like boom, 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 boom. Unfortunately, this was not during Hacktober, so I didn't get a shirt, but I have a better shirt from Pybelin. So, okay, this time I don't want to manipulate the repositories, but I want to uh, execute the talks on them. There is no uh, dedicated command for executing arbitrary command line programs, but you can list, uh, you can use all repos as a library, like um, yeah. And I had a look at the existing uh, commands, like all all repos, list repos, and this is basically the same. What, what I need to, but plus I need to execute talks. So let's have a look. When I issue all repos list repos, and I only want to do this for uh, the SOAP repositories, not for all, I can do this. And you see this is a nice little collection of uh, repositories I co-maintain. And then I had a look at the source code of all list, all repos list repos and modified it. This looks like that. Okay, so here you can see I'm using all repos as a library. I import it. Here's just the entry point for the command line program. And the fun stuff uh, starts here. I iterate over all uh, repositories. I skip two for uh, other reasons. Maybe I have time later to explain why. And then I join the path with uh, the tox INR. This is the config file for tox. And if there is uh, a tox file present, I execute or I create a sub process and execute tox on this repository. If there is a return code of zero, this means uh, tox has succeeded. That's all good. If not, I also collect the repo name for later uh, investigation. What's the problem? And I also collect uh, the the name for all the repositories where there is no tox ini file. And after that, I just print the result. So after I've done, uh, I've done this, I reported all uh, bugs. Oh, excuse me, I missed one thing. I wanted to show you how to do this. So I do execute my program uh, again only for the SOAP repositories. And here it starts, one, two, three, and so on. It will take too long for this presentation. I did this uh, previously, and this is the result. I have 17 repositories without talks. I have 62 successful runs. And over here, I have 208 uh, failures. 
This is not too bad because there are some uh, error clusters. And like when uh, TOX4, the early alpha, did not uh, implement all syntax of TOX3. And this will be fixed. I reported all the problems over here in uh, the issue trackers of SOAP and of the TOX repositories. And uh, they will be fixed in eventually. There's much to do for Garber, but I also want to support him a little bit. And I try to fix one or two of the issues myself because uh, I love uh, TOX. I want to give something back. And also, um, I think the TOX rewrite has really sophisticated code and architecture, and I learned a lot by it. And that's it. Thank you to Anthony and to Bernard for putting their open source work uh, for, for free for all the world so we can use it. And that's it. Thank you again. My name is Jürgen Gmach. Uh, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or by email. And thanks for having me here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jürgen, for uh, the lightning talk. And uh, now I will um, let Shreya introduce our next guest. Just before that, do we have any questions for Jiren? In fact, Jiren is very active on Twitter as well, and we could make it possible for him having here. It was also through Twitter. So if you want to connect with him, then please reach out to him on Twitter as well. And let's, I think we can now move on to our next speaker. Uh, and she is Padma. She is uh, working at Free Now right now, and she will be talking about what if Corona never happened. So Padma, over to you. Thank you, Shreya. I'm just going to share my screen. Just a moment. See. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about what if Corona had never happened uh, to give you a little bit of a context. Um, we had a hackathon in our company and then we wanted to find out how, how would our metrics have been if Corona did not happen because uh, we're always measuring growth and with this uh, once in a hundred year even we had all of our metrics and you know just falling off the cliff. Um, so that was the motive for, for this exercise. Um, and uh, if you see, uh, just like I explained, every year the company was growing uh, and then we were ready for the next growth race uh, when COVID came in um, and then just uh, put a big um, you know, uh, block in our growth. Um, and with, the, with this impact, with this really huge um, extreme event, uh, it's really impossible to measure uh, your over your performance um, going forward. So there was there was a request to reconstruct the KPI so that we can measure uh, our year over years better. So what I'm going to uh, do in the rest of the presentation is to give you a very neat small technique uh, which you can use to reconstruct any of the KPIs. Um, and yeah, so let's just go forward. So the first thing to note was uh, we looked at the impact of corona on different metrics and we realized we realized that some metrics were impact the top you're seeing tools and at the bottom you're seeing user level metrics so user level metrics are not so severely impacted as uh, as say the aggregate or overall metrics so it was important to find out uh, which single metric can you use as a base and then work with that to reconstruct all other derived kpis so the first important step was metric selection um, and that's what uh, i did uh, so first, what we tried, uh, how did we select the metric? So there were multiple things. One, you can work with tours, you can work with requests, you can work with uh, different variations of the same metrics, say year over year differences, 
or year over year change in the percentage growth. So there's multiple things that you can do. The other thing I want to point out here is something called the stringency index and the openness index. These two indices are available. So it, it's basically an indication of how strict the corona measures were across different countries on a daily basis for the whole year of 2020. So it's a daily index which is available in uh, the Oxford University's COVID tracker. You can find that up online. And what we did was, so we took our KPIs, our internal KPIs, and saw what was correlating well with this stringency index and we realized we found out two things once was the change one was the change in year over year tours which was correlating really well with our stringency index which means so the higher the stringency index our growth was imp uh, negatively impacted but a better correlation we were able to get with requests requests are slightly different from tours but then you can derive them it's just another metric that's coming into this so we thought let's reconstruct our kpis because this correlation is really wrong let's take the request 1920 year over year and then the stringency index and then try to uh, reconstruct this kpi so now we know that these two are strongly correlated but what does this mean for the ultimate thing that we want to do which is Okay, how would my metric look if corona did not happen? That's what I will try to explain in the next slide. So this, um, this is some uh, really ugly derivations or equations that I have put in there. Um, and just because it was a hackathon, we had very few minutes to you know, uh, fancy this slide. So, and I've kept it there as it is. Um, anyways, just to, uh, I'm gonna spend a few minutes to explain this. So what we realized was this YOY 1920 was strongly correlating with the stringency index. So we did a simple linear regression and we could get this. Then I'm trying to expand the YOY 1920 um, so that um, to, just to see how it comes. Um, and then I get number two. Uh, so towards 20 actuals, I can now express in terms of towards 19 actuals and then the stringency index and all these coefficients. But what I want is towards 20 adjusted. That is, um, what if corona did not happen? So if corona did not happen, my stringency index would have been zero. So that's what I do. So I put SI as zero in my third equation. Then I get, okay, towards adjusted in terms of towards 19, um, I will get. But that's not still what I want because um, Every week the SI is changing. Now I lost what I wanted. I, like, I wanted to express towards 20 as a function of um, stringency index. So what I do, I simply divide three by four. And now I have this really neat equation, which gives me towards 20 adjusted, which is basically what if corona did not happen um, in terms of towards 20 actuals and the stringency index of every week. So this was really neat. And then we reconstructed our KPI using this equation. So this is how it looks. So here you're looking at requests, right? So uh, the dotted line is the adjusted one. The gray line is the uh, impacted one, corona impacted one. The black line is the 2019 number. So you can see that from the 2019 number at week 10, so the x-axis is the week, at week 10 um, is when you started having lockdowns, etc. cetera, um, the number going steeply down. Uh, but when I do an adjustment using linear regression, I'm able to pull this number up a little, but still there is some um, impact because the, I mean, the lockdown was so severe and then you could still not take out this outliers here uh, around week 12 and also around week 52. So, Except for these points, we were pretty happy with how we were able to reconstruct the numbers um, across other weeks. Uh, and then for these two points, we decided, okay, um, let's jump in manually and use uh, the extrapolation from the 1819 uh, data and do an adjustment. So uh, for outliers, we did a manual adjustment, but finally uh, we, we had something really beautiful. Um, so. The gray line is the impacted one and the dark blue is the one that you adjusted. So uh, what this said is, so with Corona, our tours or whatever metric we're measuring was down 40% year over year. But if Corona did not, did not happen, it would have grown at 15%. And this was, um, this was very useful because um, it it's, helps you define the targets for the next year and, you know, take care of this extreme event.
that's that's all I had. And yeah, hope this was useful for everybody. Any questions, please uh, feel free to let me know. Thank you so much for, for the talk, uh, Padma. Um, thanks to all of you as well for joining today, this uh, special edition of Far Berlin. And uh, thanks again to all of our speakers today, to Jigyasa, Jürgen, Miro, and Padma. And again, thanks to our sponsor for uh, providing us with a premium Zoom account. Our next meetup is scheduled to take place on April 26th on Monday. Um, and everyone is very welcome to contribute to PyroLin as we can always use some extra help. So please reach out to us if you're interested in helping out. We are always looking uh, for people also to speak at Pi Berlin, if you have an idea, you can submit it by using the form linked on the slide. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, spread the word about Pi Berlin, and feel free to join the Berlin Python community Slack. That's it for today. Enjoy the rest of your week. Take care and see you next time. <laughs>